Dear friends, I greet you all in Jesus' almighty name and it gives me great joy to reach out to you all through this program, Just Beyond the Horizon, Science Faith Dialogue. Today I will be dealing with the second part of the topic, the creation account, biblical and scientific look. The creation account, biblical and scientific look. I will be dealing with this uh, topic under five subheadings. Number one, the fall and its consequences. Two, existence of giants. Number three, the issue of universal flood. Number four, the lesson that we can learn from this whole section. And also, number five, blessings of the rainbow around the throne that speaks about the future glory in heaven. Let us look at the result of sinning and promise of a savior. When we look at Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, we have to understand divine sovereignty in human probation and God's moral authority. God created Adam and Eve as persons with volitional will and power of choice. They had the semblance of God's likeness. They were not clones of God. They were not gods. They were not clones of God. It was a time of learning. And learning calls for freedom of choice and also restriction. So God gave them freedom of choice. God did not keep them in ignorance. Told them about the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. God had planted various varieties of plants that can give fruits for them. Suppose if God had planted one tree that will bring forth fruit for them to eat the whole day, it will be rather troublesome. But God provided all that they wanted, but gave a restriction. God did not keep them in ignorance, told them about the tree of life and that they can eat the fruit of the tree of life, but they were not supposed to eat the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. God planted everything for them, planned everything for them. Now, God used to visit the Garden of Eden during the cool of the day. When I look at the cool of the day, I look at it this way, the morning and the evening, the cool of the day. When Satan came to tempt Eve, she could have come to Adam to talk about it. She could have come to God to speak about it. She did not do it. Moving on, let me tell you about the dynamics of tempting, yielding and sinning and the result. When you look at the temptation that was brought in into the Garden of Eden by Satan, Genesis 3rd chapter, when you read verses 1 to 6, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, We shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent spoke to the woman and said, You will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate it. The temptation was in the area of lust of the eyes, lust of flesh and pride of life. Now the scripture says that in the midst of the garden of Eden, the tree of life was there. But when Satan came to tempt Eve, when Eve heard the words of Satan, her eyes were looking on the forbidden tree. In her vantage point, it became the center of the garden of Eden. Now what happened was when Adam and Eve yielded to the temptation brought in by Satan, they lost the image of God. They lost the presence of God. They lost their innocence and drastic inner changes came. They began to have conscience that was full of fear and guilt. They began to feel shame. They began to deal with their problems using their own wisdom. They began the blame game and rebellion. The whole nature was brought under vanity. They were cursed and chased out of God, lest they eat the fruit of the tree of life and live forever. You know, when we look at the tree of life, it had the capacity to help the humans to live for a long time in this world. Physical longevity could be received by eating the fruit of the tree of life. Cytologists say that the human cells had a capacity to live forever. If Adam and Eve had continued to be in the Garden of Eden, eating the fruit of the tree of life, they would be still living today. The whole earth would have become hell. So God knew about the consequence of eating the fruit of tree of life after they have committed sin against God. God knew about it, so God chased them out of the garden of Eden. In this situation, God gave the promise of a savior. If you read Genesis 3rd chapter, 15th verse, God told Satan, 
and I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. When you look at Revelation 13, chapter 8 verse, John wrote about the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. It speaks of the foreknowledge of God. God knew that man made as a personality with volitional will and power of choice will sin. And God was getting things ready for the salvation. So he prepared the salvation plan before the foundations of this world. God was taking a risk of love. Now, when we look at the book of Genesis, we read about the existence of giants. Genesis 6 chapter verses 1 to 7. Now it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and the daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh. Yet his days shall be 120 years. There were giants on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, they bore children to them, and they were mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of the heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was so sorry that he made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing, and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. When you look at the fossils, we are able to understand that the giants were there. Looking at the scripture regarding giants, the word of God says, There were giants on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bore children to them, those were the mighty men who were all of old, men of renown. Now, who were the sons of God who begot the giants? There are quite a few theories regarding this. And some people say the sons of God were the line of Seth. Cain killed Abel, then Seth was born. In the time of Seth, as we read in Genesis 4, chapter 26 verse, during the time of Seth, people began to worship God. Some sort of sensation came into the people. Sensitivity came into the people. At the same time, some people say that the children of Seth were the sons of God. Now the question is, if the children of Seth have committed sin with the women, how can we expect giants to be born? This view cannot be accepted. At the same time, some other people theorize and say that the sons of God were fallen angels. But when we look at the characteristics of angels, angels have no body, no sexual organ. Some people say that they were all males, no females were there. Angels are spiritual entities, ethereal beings. They have no body and so they cannot have sex with humans. At the same time, the fallen angels, the demons can incite people to have sex with one another and also with animals. When we look at the angels, they were ethereal beings and they would have no capacity to have sex with women. How to make it very clear to you? Now, if you read Matthew's Gospel 22nd chapter, 29th verse onwards. The Sadducees who did not believe in the resurrection, they came to Jesus, they wanted to corner him with a question. According to Mosaic law, if a man marries a woman and if the man dies without begetting a son, the, the husband's brother should marry her. So these Sadducees came and said that there were, there were seven brothers who married one woman, one after the other as they were dying and they never left any progeny. In the time of resurrection, they did not believe in resurrection. In the time of resurrection, whose wife she shall be? Jesus answered and said unto them, You are mistaken, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels of God in heaven. So, angels have no capacity to marry. They, are, they have no sex. They have no sex. They are ethereal beings. So, who were the sons of God? How to understand the existence of giants in the Old Testament biblical times? When God created Adam and Eve, he said that it was very good and he blessed them. I look at the formation of giants in the biblical times caused by genetic aberration, brought in by the fall and sinfulness. What is giantism? What is gigantism? It is said that the pituitary gland tumor is almost always cause of gigantism. The pea-sized pituitary gland is located at the base of your brain. It makes hormones that control many functions of your body. 
I would never say that all people who are gigantic are wrong. But at the same time, I look at this situation of giants in the Old Testament parlor in this particular way. It was brought in by genetic aberration because of fall and sinfulness. Then how to understand the concept of sons of God? If we read Jewish book of Enoch, it is a pseudepigraphal book. If you read that, it is said, in response to his defiance, God cast Azazel and many other angels down to earth. The punishment did not stop Azazel's rebellion. He became a leader of the Gregory, a group of angels who married mortal women and produced a line of monstrous children. Then he began to teach evil to humans. He taught men the art of warfare and weapons making and he taught women the art of deception which involved making and wearing cosmetics. Finally, he began teaching humans about witchcraft. His influence was so disastrous that in the book of Enoch, God says, the whole earth has been corrupted through the works that were taught by Azazel. To him ascribe all sin. This pseudepigraphal writing got included in the Bible somehow. I look at it this way. Giants were there. I look at it as a genetic aberration brought in by sinfulness of man. At the same time, what was written in the pseudepigraphal book of uh, Enoch somehow got included in the Old Testament. So we have to understand the whole concept, the right perspective and right to proper hermeneutics. Moving on, let me deal with the issue of universal flood. We can understand divine sovereignty in historical retribution and God's judicial severity. Between fall and flood, 1600 years had expired, but it is all packed into two pages in the Bible. Bible speaks more about the moral significance of this fall. Now, Genesis 6 chapter verses 5 to 12, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart, so the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and the birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God, and Noah begot three sons, Sham, Ham, and Japheth. How the floods came? If you read Genesis 7, chapter 11 and 12th verse, in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, on that day, all the fountains of the great deep were broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened, and the rain was on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. If you read Genesis 7, chapter, verses 17 to 21, and the flood was on the earth 40 days, the waters increased and lifted up the ark, and it rose high above the earth. Waters prevailed and greatly increased on the earth, and the ark moved about on the surface of the waters, and the waters prevailed exceedingly on the earth, and all the high hills under the whole heaven were covered. The waters prevailed fifteen cubits upward, and the mountains were covered. And all flesh died that moved on the earth, birds and cattle, bees and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, every man, all in whose nostrils was the breath of the spirit of life, all that was on the dry land died. Let us look at the flood from scientific perspective. Some people say that it's only localized flood, but I would say that the flood was universal. When we look at the word of God, it tells very clearly that the flood was universal. When we look at the pre-Diluvian world, the world before the flood, there were no clouds, no rain, no rainbow. Flora and fauna were same all over the world. There were no different seasons, winter, spring, summer and autumn. The pre-Diluvian world had short mountains and the seabed was not very deep. The earth's axis was straight, there is no axial tilt. It was 12 hour day and 12 hour night. How to understand Noahic flood? The word of God says that all the fountains of the great deep were broken up and the windows of heaven were open. In the previous episode I had explained that when God was recreating the whole earth, water on the earth and water beyond the atmosphere. So there was a watery canopy. So this is one way of looking at the Noahic flood. What happened was, during the Noahic flood, the waters from the watery canopy got precipitated and fell on the North Pole because of geomagnetic field moving from the South Pole to the North Pole and assaged over the whole Earth and thus tilted the Earth's axis by 23.5 degrees. 
the water was sufficient to cover the whole world. So there was sufficient water beyond the atmosphere in the watery canopy that came and fell on the North Pole. The Earth's axis tilted by 23.5 degrees, brought seasons and formation of ice caps in the North Pole and South Pole. Let us look at the Ark of Nova. The word of God says that the waters prevailed 15 cubits upward. Why 15 cubits? Many liberal theologians do not believe in universal flood, but in a localized flood in the region of Mesopotamia. When you look at the measurement of the Ark of Nova, it is 300 into 50 into 30 cubits. So it is multiples of 5. Looking at Gematria, 5 speaks about grace. And the word of God says in Genesis 7, chapter 19 and 20th verse, And the waters prevailed exceedingly on the earth, and all the hills under the whole heaven were covered. The waters prevailed 15 cubits upward, and the mountains were covered. Why 15 cubits beyond the mountain? When you look at the Ark of Noah, it was not like a boat. Scientists say that the Ark of Noah was like a cuboid. There was no sail, no machinery to move it forward. It was prepared to float on the water. The Ark of Noah was 300 into 50 into 30 cubits. The height was 30 cubits. If you had to draw a plimsoll line, it will be around 14 cubits from below. Since there was 15 cubits water above the top of the mountains, Ark of Noah was able to move over it. There was no possibility for the Ark of Noah to stumble over because of scratching on the top of the mountain. So God did everything in the right perspective. Now let us have a lesson from the Ark of Noah. God asked Noah to prepare the Ark in such a way that there would be only one door and one window, one cubit below the top. What can we learn from that? When we read Hebrews 11, chapter 7 verse, By faith Noah, being divinely warned of the things not at seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is in accordance to faith. I look at it this way. The pre diluvian world was different and the world, the futuristic world after the flood would be different. So God had asked Noah to prepare this ark so that he and his family and the animals that he chose would be able to go into the new world. Now, here in this particular verse in Hebrews, the word of God says that Noah being divinely warned of God, prepared an ark to take his family to the other world. As Noah was able to come from the pre-Diluvian world to the new world through the ark, we have an ark that God has prepared for us so that from this world, when we die, we would be in a position to go to the new world, the eternal world, and that is the body of Jesus Christ. So he is the foundation and he is the door of that particular ark that God has prepared for us, the church of Christ, church of God. I'm not talking about denominations. So this particular ark of Noah had one door and one window. Maybe there were more windows, I don't know. But at the same time, the scripture says one door and one window, one cubit below the top. So we have Jesus, the door. He said, I am the door of the sheep. Nobody can come up to God the Father except through me. When we come to Jesus and receive salvation, we enter the ark that God has prepared for us. And we can go to the next world. We can go to the eternal world through that. And one window... One cubit from the from below speaks about the prayer. Why do we have windows in our own homes, in our own houses? When we keep the window open, we are able to get breeze from outside and also we are able to get light from outside. We have bars on the window so that we will not fall outside and um, things cannot come in. In the same manner, window of prayer is important. Through the window of prayer, we can touch the, the throne room of God. We can reach out to God through the window of prayer. And God is able to answer our prayers. The heavenly light is able to come into our own heart when we pray. And also, God is able to send his wind into our own lives. God is able to send his Holy Spirit into our own lives through our prayer. When we look at the Ark of Noah, there were many animals. Let me just place before you two animals, raven and dove. What happened was... When the Ark of Noah landed on Mount Ararat, Noah wanted to find out whether the water has abated, when, whether the water had drained down. So he sent the raven. Noah sent the raven for a purpose. Go out and check whether the waters have abated. This raven was going and coming back. Why was it going out and coming in? 
What was it doing? I would look at it this way. The whole world was covered with water and carrion was there. Dead bodies were there floating on the water. Raven is an animal that can, that can eat dead, dead bodies. It can eat carrion. So the raven is to go, sit on the dead bodies with its own feet and eat all these things and come back into the ark. Bible does not say that uh, Noah was able to receive the raven when it was coming back from the from outside. So when Noah would be looking elsewhere, this raven will come and uh, stay inside the ark. So its beaks were dirty, its talons were dirty. And this is what happens in the life of many people. There are believers who are not really praying people. Such people, when they go out of their own home, out of their own church, they do evil things and bring dirt into their own church, dirt into their own home like the raven. So the raven was not able to perform the purpose for which Noah sent the raven out. Later, he sent the dove. The dove was going out and it was coming back and Noah was there to receive it in his own hand. He was not able to receive the raven when the raven was coming back. But dove, he was able to receive it. And the word of God says, the dove was not able to find a small place to rest. So it came back. Why it was not able to find a place to rest. Dow is a clean animal. It, it drinks uh, clean water. It eats uh, clean clean uh, grains. So the Dow was not in a position to go and sit anywhere. The, the, the word of God says that the Dow was not able to put its foot, not feet, one foot. To speak about the foot, there are two words, calf and yad. Calf means the whole foot. And yad is the center of the foot when the fingers are lifted up. Just imagine for a, dove to, for a dove to stand on a particular area, it needs only a small portion. It was not able to find a clean place to put one foot. It was a clean animal. So it was coming back. So again, after some time, he was sending the dove. One evening, the dove was coming back and in its mouth, olive leaves were there. What can we learn from the olive leaves? Olive leaf speaks about victory. It speaks about something fresh, something new some blessings in the future. So the little dove was able to bring joy to the uh, ark of Noah. So we have to bring joy to our own home. We have to bring blessings to our own church. As we go out and come back, we have to be like this dove. Our words must be clean. Our talents must be clean. Our conduct must be clean. So this is the lesson that we can learn from the raven and dove that ark of Noah had. Noah's Ark has been found on Mount Ararat near Turkey, an Iranian border, by Ron Wyatt. It is said that the Garden of Eden was in the place where the Ark had landed. It is a plateau, 4,000 feet above the sea level, surrounded by very tall mountains. In that secure place, the Ark of Noah came and rested. There can be a question, what happened to the flood waters? The whole world was covered by water. What happened to the water? Where did it go? The pre-Diluvian world had short mountains and the seabed was not very deep, we can say. The Lord shook the earth and there was moving of continental plates. The mountains began to grow and grow taller and the seabed began to go deeper. So the water could be accommodated in this, in this fashion. It is said that the Himalayan mountains is growing every year by one centimeter. Because of the Indian Peninsula, it is moving towards the north and the mountain is growing. So the continental plates had been moving. So the Lord said, I shook the earth and going to shook heaven and the earth. And also sunlight was striking over the water directly and the water began to evaporate and clouds were formed and that brought in rain on the needy land. It is said that there are 23 million cubic kilometers of water that are in the subterranean rocks. The total amount of groundwater on the planet held in the rocks and soil below our feet is estimated to be 23 million cubic kilometers. The new calculation comes from a Canadian-led team and is published in the journal Nature Geoscience. Now, moving on, look at Peter's words on the creation of the earth. If we read 2 Peter, 3rd chapter, verses 5 to 7, for this they willfully forget that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of water and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth which are now preserved by the same word are reserved for the fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. 
the phrase where of old heavens where of old speaks about long ago peter was a fisherman but the holy spirit led him to write about the earth and water water is 70% and land mass is 30% on the earth there is not going to be flood again throughout the world but it is reserved for fire moving on i want to deal with one question why was noah drunk why was noah drunk if you read genesis 9 chapter verses 20 to 26 and noah began to be a farmer and he planted a vineyard then he drank of the wine and was drunk and became uncovered in his tent and Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. But Sham and Japheth took a garment, laid it on both of their shoulders and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned away and they did not see their father's nakedness. So Noah awoke from his wine then he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants he shall be to his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and may Canaan be his servant. Can we imagine Noah who walked with God, who was a righteous man in his own generation, being drunk and lying naked? This is how I look at this problem. As I already explained, the water canopy was there beyond the atmosphere before the flood of Noah. The earth had only one axis, so 12 hour day, 12 hour night was there. Flora and fauna was same all over. Because of the watery canopy, the temperature in the atmosphere was very low. It was like an air conditioning. The pre-diluvian world was under the watery canopy and the temperature was very low and grape juice did not get fermented. After the flood, the watery canopy had come down, the temperature shortened and the grape juice fermented and poor Noah did not know about it. We did not read about Noah drinking again. And also, even before the flood of Noah, drinking habit was not there. We don't read about it in the Bible. My answer to this question, why was Noah drunk? I would say he did not know about it. He did not know about it. When Ham saw the nakedness of Noah, his father, he could have covered his father's nakedness, but he went and told his brothers in a mocking manner. So he was cursed. So I would say that Noah continued to be a righteous man. When Noah and his family came out of the ark, and the animals also came. What happened to them? Genesis 8 chapter verses 20 to 22. The Noah built an altar to the Lord and took every clean animal and every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled the smoothing aroma. Then the Lord said in his own heart, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake, although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Nor will I again destroy every living thing as I have done. While the earth remains, Seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, and day and night shall not cease. If you look at the pre-diluvian world, seasons were not there. Seasons were not there. Flora and fauna was same all over the whole world. Here we see God telling that while the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, and day and night shall not cease. Genesis 9 chapter 12 to us, then God said, this is a sign of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations i set my rainbow in the cloud and it shall be for a sign of the covenant between me and the earth this earth is reserved for fire not water now god shook the earth is going to shake the whole world once more when we look at the rainbow rainbow is seen only when there is cloud before the flood of Noah, no cloud was there. The watery canopy was far beyond the atmosphere. So there was no cloud, no rain was there, no rainbow was there. So this rainbow became a promise. When we look at the rainbow, rainbow is not circle. It is only half, half circle. We cannot see full rainbow on this year. So when you look at the rainbow, I'm able to bring out something that is very important. We can understand some beautiful lessons. What is our responsibility? Psalm 19, 1 to 2 says, Heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utters speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. Looking at the creation account biblically and scientifically, we can get sufficient knowledge about God and his plan for us. Let us be humble, communicate with him on a daily basis, and understand his will, and do his will at all times. Now, if we read Revelations 4, chapter, verses 1 to 3, after these things I looked and behold, a door standing open in heaven, John wrote, 
and the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me saying, come up here and I will show you things which must take place after this. Immediately I was in this spirit and behold a throne set up in heaven and one sat on the throne and he who sat there was like a jasper and a sardis stone in appearance and there was rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. Let us long to go into the eternal world which God has prepared for us to see the full rainbow of everlasting blessings. So when you look at the rainbow on this earth, it is only half. We do not fully understand the plans that God has kept for us in eternity. This message can give to us sufficient impetus to prepare ourselves to go into eternal world. When we see the partial rainbow, let us long for the glorious rainbow around the throne of God. I believe that this episode had been a blessing to you. The Lord be with you. Amen. Thank you.